Well, good morning, everyone. It is good to be together to worship today. Uh, so welcome to all of you who are here, whether it's your first time or your 71st time. It is good to have you with us. Uh, also, a warm welcome to those who are worshiping with us uh, over the internet. Uh, it's, it's good to be together, no matter how we manage that. This land on which we worship at St. Mark's is uh, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg, specifically Chippewa and Ojibwe peoples. This land is subject to the Jay Collins Land Purchase and Lake Simcoe Treaty 16. It is my hope that we will all learn to live as uh, treaty people with respect for creation and for the original peoples of this land. There are a couple of special days in the congregation this week. I'm sorry to say that Jim Walsh isn't here because it's his birthday on Wednesday. It's also my grandson William's birthday on Wednesday. They are birthday buddies, and uh, William is going to be seven. I don't know about Jim. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he's not going to be seven. But let's, uh, let's uh, sing to them. This week we have uh, uh, some activities that uh, you may, may want to know about. Tomorrow morning is Feed My Sheep at Harriet Todd Public School. Um, we meet there at 7.30 to feed a lot of hungry little people some warm, good warm breakfast. Um, Tuesday is Knit One Pray Two in the morning and session on Tuesday afternoon. Choir practice is Thursday morning. And I think that's all that's coming up this week. Um, last week we mentioned that we uh, have are, are renewing the women's breakfast, and that is going to be happening. The first uh, women's breakfast meeting is going to be March the 8th at 9 a.m. at the Curling Club. So if you would like to come and you need a ride, just let me know or let one of the elders know and we'll, we'll figure that out for you. All, all are welcome. And I'm leaving it up to the men to organize their own <laughs> breakfast. <laughs> there used to be a little bit of a competition to see who could, who could get more for breakfast. We'll see what happens with that now. Uh, many of you will remember that Knit One Pray Two has been busy making quilts, uh, two quilts for the hospital. Uh, and um, they are finished now and we have them here and we're going to bless them. So I'm going to ask everyone who had a hand in making those quilts to come forward. Uh, there's lots of you here, so don't be shy, Doug. <laughs> Linda Piercy, Linda Piercy, could you come and help us, please? <laughs> so I'm going to ask if you can hold them open. Um, there's, there's one with the colored side out, and here's the other one. Can Okay, Barb and Elda, come on on this side so you can get in the picture. Let's hold it open and hold it out. Here we go. Now, what do you think? Aren't they beautiful? These will be used um, in the uh, visitation room of the hospital, and I know that they will bring comfort to the families who, who need that, uh, that spot. So I'm, we're just going to say a, a, a prayer of, and ask for God's blessing on these quilts and those who made them and those who will use them. So let's pray. God of love and grace, we thank you for the gifts that you have given to us, particularly those gifts we can use to bless others. We thank you for the opportunity to create items of beauty, in particular these quilts that will bring comfort to so many in our community. Bless these quilts, bless those who have contributed to their creation. 
in all we do, may we bring you glory. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, thank you. We are... <laughs> oh, can you turn around to the choir so they can see them? The choir, the, the quilts, can you just... Oh, this is going to take some doing. <laughs> We're Can okay you here. No, no they want it they want the choir wants to see them. Oh they want the choir wants to see them. Okay. Isn't that beautiful? So thank you thank you to everyone who is involved in that. Doug, you can just leave them on the front pew there. <coughs> Thank you. Today is, uh, as many of you will know, the first Sunday of Lent, those 40 days, not counting Sundays, that precede Easter. And uh, we are going to begin a new Lenten series today that comes complete with some new music that I think is quite beautiful. I hope you will enjoy learning some new music as well as we'll sing some good old uh, familiar pieces as well. Um, during this Lenten series, um, I'm going to uh, be preaching a, a sermon series as well that's entitled Women on the Way. And uh, this was a, a project that uh, my, my colleagues and fellow travelers to the Holy Land and I came up with while we were there um, because the tour we went on was called The Women in Jesus Life. And uh, we realized that women don't, don't always get the focus as being important to the ministry of Jesus that some of the men do, but they absolutely were uh, uh, pivotal in Jesus' ministry here on earth. And we can see that through the interactions that they had with Jesus. So in this sermon series, by looking at a series of interactions that women had with Jesus, we'll see the way that they influenced Jesus and that they accompanied him on his way to the cross. So I hope you will enjoy that, uh, both the worship series and the sermon series during Lent. I'm going to invite Mary Silk to come forward and share some good news with us for today. Those quilts were lovely, by the way. Um, so nice and big and really well done. I have a little prop today. <clears throat> and I also want to get Sue O'Neill and Reverend Linda to stand up, too, because they are all... Well, Sue was on the walk with me last night, and Reverend Linda and I are going to walk today uh, for the coldest night of the year. And Sue forgot to bring her toque today, or she would have it on too. <laughs> I just wanted to give you a little bit of statistics about last night's walk, because it really is a, something to be proud of for all of us. And thank you so much to everyone that encouraged us by giving us donations and little words of encouragement. So thank you very much for that. Um, we were in Aurelia, or sorry, our team, CFUW Walkers, placed 31 across all of Canada. And there were 5,919 teams in Canada. So that's pretty good. Thank you. Um, and across Canada, there were 36,794 walkers, 5,516 volunteers, 
129,567 donors and 182 locations. So it just gives you an indication of how much activity this generates across Canada and how much money is raised for, for different, in each location, they choose a charity that they want to um, spot, that they want to give money to. And here it was the Lighthouse Center. And a lot of them are food banks. Um, places like the Lighthouse Center where um, people can get in out of the cold. In Aurelia, we didn't get to the thousand. We were trying. Our team really tried hard. We went from eight last year to 25 this year. So we were trying to get them, get Aurelia to the thousand. That was a goal they had. But they did get to 679 walkers, 94 teams, 135 volunteers. And the goal of 200,000, they've right now, uh, they've raised 98%, which is 197, 288. But they're still raising money until March 31st. So I have no doubt that we'll get over the 200,000 for the Lighthouse Center. And Oh, that's it's just this year. This walk. This walk, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And Aurelia is one of the the biggest in all across Canada, actually. Um, there have been times when we stood third or fifth. This year, it was 31st because there were some teams that really raised a lot. Um, last year, um, just our team was close to the top in Canada, but this year we're down 31. So some of the teams were really raising huge money. But I'm still very proud of what we've raised. We, we have done so well. Um, we raised $17,795. And I don't know, 25 cents, I'm not sure where that came from. <laughs> but... Um, but th that's, that's phenomenal for one, like our one team, CFUW, really raised that much. So thank you very much to everyone. And um, this year we were trying to help Aurelia make their 1,000 uh, walkers, and we had 25 members from eight last year to 25 this year. So um, thank you to everyone, and thank you to the walkers. Thanks, Sue and Linda. And um, yeah, just thanks. That is certainly good news, Mary, so thank you for sharing that with us. We're just going to take a moment to quiet our hearts and our minds as we prepare to worship, and then we're going to begin with the choir uh, singing one of our new pieces uh, for Lent. is a wonderfully reflective time to reassess where we are searching for meaning and purpose. A question for us this year is, don't we often look for wholeness and happiness in places that offer only temporary good feelings and satisfaction? We will discover that the stories of Jesus show us how to truly love.
us join together in opening our hearts to the love of God. Before we utter even a word, we can be assured that God will offer us grace and a way forward. For this reason, we can be honest with what pains us most about our own thoughts and actions. Please join with me in prayer. Holy and merciful one, in this season of discernment, we come bringing our deepest longings and our failed attempts at satisfying them. We have often looked for love, for acceptance and security, in the trappings of notoriety, popularity, and power that diminish others in order to gain for ourselves. We yearn for lives that matter. We desire relationships that thrive. We want less regret. At times, we fail to see that you have already given us what really matters your love and acceptance. You provide opportunities all around us to make a difference in the lives of others. You give us a fresh start each day, inviting us to do better. In this silence, we bring to you our pleas for openness to a different way of living. My friends, be assured by the psalmist who says, I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Let us now respond together. We open our hearts, our minds, our souls, our vision to the ways of love created by God, embodied in Jesus, and already moving in us by the Spirit. We are forgiven, loved, and freed. Amen. The love and peace of Christ be with you all. I would invite you, we're not quite at that point in time where we can get up and walk around and pass the peace to each other, but I would invite you just to uh, pass the love and peace of Christ to each other by extending the the universal sign for peace as you look around at those worshiping with us. I would invite you now to join in singing our first hymn, Lord, who throughout these 40 days. A few weeks ago, I was playing a game of cribbage, a three-handed uh, game of cribbage, which I'm not all that used to, um, but one of the people who I was playing with um, was new to cribbage, 
Now, some of you will know that it takes a little time and practice to be really good at counting out uh, the points as you play the game and also the points that may be in your hand. And it seems that everyone has a little bit of a different take on the rules of how you, how you count out, uh, out the points in your hand. Now, I, as I say, it was a three-handed game of cribbage. So I was playing with someone who was kind of new to the game, someone who was really good, and I was somewhere in between the two of them. But what was really nice was that the experienced player wouldn't let the newer player miss any of their points. So when my friend would counter cards, the other friend would say, no, nope, wait, there's more. And she'd have to figure out where they were. She'd say, no, wait, there's more. Even when we were doing the 15-2 and all that stuff, sh if she forgot one of the things that she could have she counted, my friend would say, no, look, there's more. And as I was sitting there listening to this repeated over and over, no, wait, there's more, look, there's more, I got to thinking about how often in life we miss out on the abundance of the good gifts that God gives to each of us just because we fail to take the time to notice them. We're not practiced enough in appreciating all the good gifts that God gives to us. So what if for even for the next week, if every day we said to ourselves, no, wait, there's more. What if we took the time to notice and be grateful for the extravagant and abundant way that God blesses our lives? I think perhaps Lent might be the perfect time to slow down and say to ourselves, no, wait, there's more, and give thanks to God for those gifts. Amen. During our sermon series, we are going to, as I said, learn some new music. Uh, this next piece is called Love Us Into Fullness. And we are going to be, uh, the choir will be singing, and we will hopefully be joining in, singing a verse and then having a reading and a verse and another reading and so on during the presentation of the Word of God. So, over to you. Our first reading is Psalm 32. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity and whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. At a time of distress, the rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle, else it will not stay near you. Many are the torments of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart.
Our gospel reading today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who drew the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Thank you very much. That was beautiful. Let us pray. In the name of God the Father, our Creator, 
God the Son, our Redeemer, and God the Spirit, our Sustainer. Amen. Water is life. I saw those three words scrawled with a black magic marker on the life jackets of two little boys and their dad as they paddled their canoe alongside my kayak as part of the two row wampum paddle on the Grand River that we were both or we were all participating in a few years ago. Water is life. Now Neil, who is the dad, was very serious about teaching his boys about the really important things in life, including water and conserving natural areas and fostering healthy relationships with each other. His dedication as a parent really impressed me. The words that parents say to their children are important. They can be life-changing. Since then, I've noticed those words several times, mostly referring to the importance of clean water. And of course, that is a very important and legitimate use of that phrase. I think it's a campaign we should all be supporting because in a very literal way, without water, we all would die. But I think it's appropriate to call that phrase to mind as we consider our gospel story this morning. Because a few thousand years ago, water was one of the key players in a drama played out at a wedding in a small town called Cana. Water and abundant life were inextricably linked. Now imagine for a moment the scene. Jesus and his disciples are at a wedding and the hosts run out of wine. If that were to happen to us, it might be convenient, perhaps even embarrassing, but would it really be such a big deal? Well, in Jesus' time, it was, because in that time and place, running out of wine too early wasn't just a sign of bad planning, it was a a disaster. Because wine wasn't just a beverage, it was considered to be a sign of the harvest, of God's abundance, of joy and gladness and hospitality. And so when they ran short on wine, in their minds, perhaps they'd run short of God's blessing. And that would have been a very big deal. So that's when Jesus, prompted by his mother, steps in and provides not just wine, but more wine than the whole crowd could have drunk not only throughout the whole wedding feast, but probably in three weeks. When Jesus changed the water of those six large jugs of water that had been set aside for purification, he provided close to what would have been a thousand bottles of wine in our time. And not only that, but as the surprised steward discovered, it wasn't just cheap plonk, it was the best wine going. Now, on our trip last year, we discovered that the real miracle wasn't that Jesus turned water into wine, but in fact that he made so much that they're still selling it in Cana today. When we study each of the Gospels, the first things that are recorded in each of the Gospels is kind of a sign of of the uh, take that Gospel writer is going to give us on Jesus' ministry. The first things that are recorded in them matter a great deal. As we have noted before, the Gospels all tell a different story, some slightly different, some really different, of Jesus' ministry. They were written for different audiences. They each had a different focus. Matthew reports that Jesus healed every sort of disease and sickness. Mark describes the exercising of a demon as the first thing that Jesus did. Luke reports the first thing that Jesus did was preach a sermon of freedom and healing and release. And each of these things matters as they set the tone and the emphasis for those particular Gospels. 
We read today about the very first thing Jesus does, the first act of his public ministry in the Gospel of John. And it's not a healing, it's not an exorcism, it's not a sermon. The very first experience of what we read about in the Gospel of John in John 1, 16 is, from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Grace is a key for the writer of the Gospel of John. And that day at the wedding in Cana is just the beginning of instances recalled in the Gospel of John as one grace upon grace moment after another. And we get to feel and see and touch and hear, and in this case, taste that grace that is offered to each one of us. So what does grace upon grace mean? tastes like, you might ask? Well, maybe it tastes like the best wine and gallons and gallons of it, just when you would least expect it. There are a few things that I notice when I read this story, and perhaps they caught your attention as you listen to it too. The first is the importance of Mary, Jesus' mother. We don't often hear Mary speak, but when she does, we should pay attention. As Christians, I think we tend to pay a lot of attention to the words we hear from the voice of God, and that is a good thing. Over the past weeks, we've been paying attention to the words of God referencing Jesus. This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. This is my son, the beloved, Listen to him. We've also focused on some of Jesus' own words. Get up and do not be afraid. Sometimes, though, I think we forget that Mary was Jesus' other parent. And I'm not sure we always give her voice the weight that it deserves. And so today I want us to think about the words that are uttered in this story by Mary, the mother of Jesus. They were short and to the point. Perhaps they were whispered, but undoubtedly said with some urgency and perhaps a raising of her eyebrows, they have no wine. Now, we don't know Mary's relationship to the happy couple, if they're relatives or friends, but we do know that the wedding celebration would go on for days. And in this case, we're invited onto the scene on the third day of that wedding feast. So presumably, plenty of wine has already been poured and much food has already been enjoyed. It's at this point that Mary notices that the stores of wine have run out. She is paying attention. She is more attentive even than Jesus. And she doesn't hesitate to speak out when she sees a need. She doesn't want the host to be embarrassed. And so she turns to her boy, to Jesus, because she knows him. She knows his character and his ability and his generosity. And Mary is persistent. Despite Jesus' initial reaction, he says to his mom, what concern is that to you and me? Which I always kind of wonder about the tone that he might have said that to his mother in. Um, He says, my hour has not yet come. But Mary doesn't cave in the face of his reluctance. She continues to press the urgency of the situation. Now, I wish I was a fly on the wall to look at the perhaps pointed looks that might have been exchanged between mother and son at that point, almost as if Mary were saying, I don't care about your hour. There's a problem right here and right now. So change your plans and start helping. And then she turns to the household servants and says, do whatever he tells you. It's like she's communicating to them and to Jesus, her trust in him that he will do the right thing, that the character she helped to instill in him during his first 30 years of life will win out, that he will respond with generosity and empathy. 
God's proclamation following Jesus' baptism that reminded everyone that Jesus was God's beloved son and that God was well pleased with him signified the start of Jesus' ministry here on earth at the age of 30. Today, we read the voice of Jesus' mother, a signal to Jesus that perhaps his hour had indeed come, that it was time for that first miracle to take place. And I wonder if one of the lessons of this story is that we shouldn't be afraid to use our voices to encourage and build up others so that they can be prompted to take action. When we see a need, we should speak up. When we see the gifts that others have to meet that need, we should not hesitate to point that out. And even if they protest, we are called to be like Mary, to be persistent. Now, another thing I notice in this story is the important role that was played by those who normally would be on the margins of society, specifically the servants who were serving at the wedding feast, those young men who carried buckets after buckets of water to fill those enormous jars. Those servants who'd been stationed on the edge of the celebration were the only ones to actually witness the miracle here. Now, of course, the chief steward tasted the wine and apparently his taste buds were still sensitive enough so he was able to enjoy the fine quality of it. And I'm sure the bridegroom and the bride and all their guests enjoyed the gift of the miracle of the water turned into wine, but still, it was only the servants who saw this miracle play out right before their eyes. It was the servants who saw it all, those who most likely didn't even get a sip of those gallons and gallons of fine wine that was being stored in the stone jars. But they were the ones who went home with quite a story that night. They were the ones who first glimpsed the promise of Jesus. As we are so often reminded throughout the gospel, they are the ones for whom the gifts of God are especially met, meant. So whether they ever tasted this extraordinary wine or not, they must have gone home hardly believing the abundance that they had witnessed that day, with the dawning recognition that something world-changing had happened when Jesus arrived on the scene. Water. The source and sustainer of life was the key ingredient in Jesus' first miracle. It was a sign of God's endless capacity to transform the ordinary into the sacred, the weaker into the stronger, the incomplete into the whole. It reminds us of the abundance of grace, grace upon grace, as John writes, that is offered to us through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. Water made possible this miracle that affirms of the importance of joy and celebration and pleasure and hospitality. Water became the means for Jesus to use this miracle to show us what the grace of God is like, an overflowing, an abundance of joy and blessing. Water became the conduit for us to learn that when you do what Jesus tells you, abundance follows. Amen. In this season of Lent, we will come together in prayer using an ancient form of prayer in the church. The Greek words Kyrie eleison mean God have mercy on us, and Christo eleison means Christ have mercy on us. The church has been chanting this during prayer since the early centuries of its existence, and we will be led in various prayers in different categories, followed by this simple singing of Kyrie Eliaison as a response to each one. 
The repetition of this beautiful Kyrie is itself a prayer. God's mercy is a gift of love given freely to us. So I'm going to invite the choir to sing it for us first, and then I would invite you to join in singing it so that we can learn it together. Let us pray. Loving Creator, we come to you asking for strength to resist injustice in this world. You created a world in which we are a global community, connected and interdependent. Show us how to love, so that when one part of the human family is affected by hate, war, hunger or disaster, we will move to right any wrongs and alleviate suffering for the sake of all. You have created a planet full of such wonder and diversity. Show us how to love this planet home as our precious dwelling, assuring the flourishing of all living things. We pray this day particularly for the people of, Cra of Ukraine living in the midst of an unjust war, for the people of Turkey and Syria as they struggle to survive following a series of earthquakes. God, have mercy. In this singing, we lift up this world to you with our love. Loving God, we come to you asking for strength to make a difference in our communities. You created us for a beloved community, bringing what we can offer and honoring others for their contributions. You invite us to love our neighbors. Show us how to love more widely, more deeply, especially when others are hurting. We pray this day for those who do not have a place to lay their heads at night, who live with uncertainty, wondering where their next meal will come from and how they will take care of their families. May we respond with compassion, empathy and real assistance when we come face to face with those in need. God have mercy. In this singing we lift up this community to you with our love. O oh God, our loving parent, we come to you asking for strength to make our homes and relationships places of love. You showed us what love looks like in the companionship of Jesus, who invited all to his table, touched the untouchables with healing, spoke with and drew close those who were shunned by others. Open us more completely than we can imagine so that our love may break through the most difficult of situations. We pause now in silence as we each lift up in our hearts the relationships that need your love. God, have mercy. In this singing, we lift up each other to you with our love. (laughs) 
Lover of our souls, we come to you asking for strength to love ourselves. In the beginning, you created us in your own image, giving us life and breath and the ability to love. And yet we find it difficult sometimes to love what you have created, to believe that you called us good. Help us know the lure of your love for us so that we may be your love in this world, in our communities and in the lives with whom we intersect each day. God, have mercy. In this singing, we open ourselves to your love. And so as your people following in the ways of your son, Jesus, who set the pattern of love as resistance to the temptations of fleeting fame and fortune, we pray with confidence the prayer that he taught us to say together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God is a generous giver of gifts. May we, may we offer our tri offering and tributes with praise and thanks for the gifts that we give are merely gifts from God. The offering will now be received. pray. At the wedding feast at Cana, O God, you gladdened the guests with divine generosity, filled to the brim and flowing over. We offer our gifts with grateful hearts. Bless them and our lives to your service that they may reveal your glory, nurture faith, and manifest the common good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our final hymn today is Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Thank you. 
Life is short, and there is not much time to gladden the hearts of those who walk the way with us. So make haste to love, be swift to be kind. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you and those you love this day and forevermore. Amen.